Good morning, Common Ground Vineyard family. It's Pastor B, and I am here with part two of seven letters. That's right. We're back with the message series, seven letters. This is part two as we are talking about faithful suffering. And so if you would join me this morning, I'm going to open up in prayer and we are going to get into the message. Father, would you help us today, Lord? God, would you help me today? Would you, Lord God, allow me to humbly deliver this word? God, would you move in a mighty way? God, in this divine partnership, as you use whatever you use from my faculties, God, I ask you, Father, that you would empower me to speak boldly what your word declares and to speak, Lord God, as you give utterance. I thank you for this, Lord, and I pray in Jesus' name. We all pray in Jesus' name, and we say amen. All right, so seven letters. Just a quick recap for those of you who missed part one of the series. We're talking about the seven letters that Jesus commanded to be written to seven churches in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is a book where we see the Apostle John who has been exiled. He's a prisoner on the island of Patmos. And John receives a visitation from the Lord Jesus. Jesus appears to him in a vision, an epic vision. And Jesus shows him past, present, and future, and all manner of things that blow John's mind. And Jesus is commanding John to write down the things that he sees. And specifically at the beginning of the book of Revelation, Jesus says to John, I want you to write seven letters to seven churches because I want you to let them know that I am coming back and they need to remember to hold fast to what they were given. And so as we enter in to the book of Revelation once again, we're going to be looking at the letter to the church in Smyrna. Last week we talked about the letter to the church of Ephesus. Now we're focusing on the letter to the church in Smyrna. So here we go. Revelation chapter 2. Verses eight and nine, Jesus says to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, in typical Jesus fashion, I love this, Jesus speaks a lot of truth and he uses very few words. Jesus says, I know you've been suffering. I know you've been going through some struggles and you've fallen on hard times, but trust that you are wealthy. You're wealthy in the kingdom of God. And we need to understand that the city of Smyrna was a very wealthy and prominent city in its day. But Jesus wasn't talking about material wealth. No, Jesus was referring to the fact that they were wealthy because as Christians, as those who were the people of God, they had wealth in a kingdom that surpasses this world. And so Jesus told them, listen, you're going through a rough time right now, but you are not people who are the minority. You are not people who are the weaker. You are not the lesser. If anything, you are greater because the kingdom principles state that the least is the greatest and the last will be first. So Jesus says, hey, don't Consider your economic status. Consider your eternal kingdom status. And as a matter of fact, the Christians back in these days were called atheists. I know it's hard to believe, but at one point in time, Christians in the Roman Empire were called atheists because they did not follow the Roman gods. So they were considered to be people who were blasphemers of the true religion. And not only were the Christians hated by the Romans, 
But the Christians were also despised by Jewish believers. And so they really couldn't go anywhere and get approval from anyone. This was a people who would not be accepted by either group, the Romans, the Jews, those who were philosophical, those who were very religious. They could not fit in anywhere. And it's interesting because that's what we're seeing today. As you broadcast Christian worldviews, as you talk about things from a kingdom perspective, what tends to happen is, is you're shut out or, or people might try to shut shut you down because what they are are declaring is something that is antithetical to what the Christian believes, to what the Christian holds dear. Things like the sanctity of life or social justice and, and racial justice, things that matter at the heart of our faith are often things that are 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 opposed by the world. And so what we see is that Jesus says, hey, listen, y'all, even though everybody surrounding you despises what you are and what you stand for, trust that you have a platform. Trust that you are prominent. Man, this is good stuff. Wow. These people these Christians in the church of Smyrna were on the outskirts of society. These were the ones who were, 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 were cast aside. But Jesus tell them, don't feel like an outcast and don't live as though you are worthless. You have worth and it doesn't matter what they say about you. This is something good for someone. This is a word for someone today because there are those out there who will try to cast down your value and try to minimize your message. But Jesus says, no, listen, you have a message that is worth preaching and declaring and speaking and don't be afraid to proclaim it even in the public square. Don't let them shut you down and don't let them shut you out. And concerning those, those false believers, Jesus says, those deceiving Jews, those who say they are the chosen people of God, that they are the children of Abraham, they are not, Jesus says, you need to understand, they are not truly God's people. God, now you hear me clearly now, God chose Israel as his chosen nation of people and God will always honor the seed of Abraham, both physical and spiritual. But what Jesus says is that there are those who have the religious appearance. There are those who look the part, who talk the part, who dress the part, but they don't live as true Jews. Paul, the apostle, said that a Jew is not one outwardly. A Jew is a Jew inwardly. Just because you circumcise and just because you celebrate Sabbath and just because you do all the, the law and follow the Torah, it does not mean that you have a relationship with God. And so Jesus says, these are not people who are really people of God. They are not really chosen of God. They're not followers of Yahweh, the one true God. Blessed be his name. No, these are followers of Satan. Jesus says, these people persecuting you, they say that they're Jewish and they say that they're doing a service to God by locking you up and, and, and trying to put you to death. But Jesus says, yo, they are not real followers. Understand, they are the synagogue of Satan. And that word synagogue is a word that has multiple meanings. Jesus says that, that, that their synagogue of Satan, meaning that they gather together. They even have a house of worship. A synagogue is a house of worship, but a synagogue is also a place where verdicts are rendered, where judgment is cast. So Jesus says, yo, these people cast judgment upon you and it's not godly judgment. They gather together to plot against you. They don't gather together to give glory to God. Their houses of worship are places of corruption. And so Jesus tells the Christians, he says, hey, be encouraged. Why? Because you are faithful. And there are others who are unfaithful, 
but I am going to deal with them. You stay the course. Listen to what he says. He tells them, guys, you're battling against Satan's forces. You're battling against those who want to come against Christ. That is to say they follow the anti Christ and they've been trying to keep you down. But I need you to listen up because Satan and this is man. Oh, my goodness. The Lord is speaking to somebody today. Satan has tried to disrupt your financial prosperity. He's tried to harm your health. And most importantly, Satan has attempted to uproot the word of God as the foundation for your home. And you may be sitting destitute. You may be sitting there and you're saying, man, I'm so poor. But Jesus said, remember, Matthew chapter five, blessed are the poor in spirit. Huh? Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. So you, you, you are not cursed. You are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You may be destitute and begging the Lord Jesus to release you from Satan's trap. You're saying, Lord, I don't know how much more I can handle this. I don't know how much more I can handle the oppression. Satan jumping on my back, beating me down, trying to get after me, trying to get at me, trying to take my family, trying to harm what what you've given me, God, trying to take me and take me out and trying to take me away from the faith. I don't know if I can handle it, but listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to take away the suffering and you need to know this he will not always take away the suffering rather there are times where Jesus comes to comfort us in suffering and this is what he calls us to be faithful Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2 in verse 10 he says do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer wow He's forecasting. He's prophesying. Jesus is saying, hey, suffering is coming. Imagine if I told you that you would suffer. You would you would probably give in to fear. But Jesus says, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. He says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to do what? To test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 years. Days, Jesus says, the devil will put you in prison to test you. Wow. Now, now here it is. I want you to understand this because the, the, the wording can, can be a little confusing. You might say, well, Satan is trying to test us. No, Satan does not administer test because he is not the master. He is not the test proctor. He is not the instructor. No, it is God who is giving the test, who is over the class, who is over the lesson, God simply allows Satan to hand you the test. He will hand you the test, and it may be the hardest test you've ever taken. It could be multiple choice. It could be short answer. It could be essay. And guess what? You haven't had a chance to study for it. You have not had a chance to prepare for the test. You've not had a chance to really get the material and, and, and get ahead of the test. But God says, guess what? Satan is going to be allowed to hand you the test, but I've got a cheat sheet. <laughs> I love it. I, God says, yo, I got a cheat sheet. Why? Because I gave you the book of Revelation. I gave you the, the, the answers ahead of time. What's the answer? Do not give in to fear. Do not be afraid because you're about to have suffering. But guess what? But guess what? I'm letting you know this so that you can stand firm. And even if you're sweating it out and you got your pencil in your hand and you're putting your pencil to paper and trying to, to, to write down the answers, don't worry. I've got you. I've got you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Jesus says he'll put you in prison to test you. You will suffer persecution for 10 days. And now one of my favorite preachers, one of my favorite teachers, a man by the name of Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Uh, I, I give him all credit for pointing this out. Dr. McGee points out that 10 days 
are not 10 literal days. You have to remember when we read the book of Revelation, we're not reading a literal historical narrative account. All right, I know I'm throwing out a lot of words out there, but yo, I got to give it to you because this is important for us. Many of us don't understand. We try to read Revelation like everything is literal, but it's not because one rule of reading apocalyptic literature, literature that has everything to do with things that are figurative. We have to understand that some things, most things, are figurative and not literal. So the 10 days are not 10 literal days. Dr. McGee points out that there were actually 10 periods of time over several years, over decades, where Christians suffered persecution under the Roman Empire. Christians suffered persecution. These Christians in Smyrna and Christians across the Roman Empire suffered persecution under the emperors of Nero, uh, men who like Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, Diocletian, and others persecuted the church. And there were 10 periods specifically where the church was persecuted heavily. And so Jesus says, hey, you're going to suffer some periods of intense persecution, but be faithful, be faithful. Jesus says at the end of verse 10, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Wow. Ah, wow. I don't know about you, but I'm preaching myself excited. He says, I'm going to give you life as your victor's crown. He says, so if you suffer even to death, don't worry. Your life is found in me. And we're going to explore that more as we wrap up this letter. But Jesus says, don't you worry about what's going to happen in this world because I've got something greater for you. Now, I want you to hear that clearly. Jesus says, do what? Be faithful. Be faithful. Jesus encourages us to have faith under fire because all over the world, even today, Christians are challenged to be faithful. We are being challenged to be faithful. Just consider the coronavirus has shut a lot of us in has shut a lot of us up behind our barriers. We've we, we, we kind of closed up and, and there's been a challenge to how do we get the gospel out effectively? I've had people say to me, Pastor Brian, I feel the videos, but it's not the same as in person. Yo, I totally get that. And I respect that. We, and, and so we're challenged in how we demonstrate and minister the gospel. We're challenged in how we demonstrate and minister racial justice and how we go against social injustices, even in this season of our society in the United States and all over the world. We are challenged to do what Jesus said to be faithful full to be faithful and when i consider that 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 faithfulness i think of men like dr martin luther king jr who stood up in the public square who was not afraid to proclaim what the holy spirit had given him he said i had a dream but that dream was something that god had shown him that one day there would be healing there would be reconciliation that there would be a time where people would not be judged by the color of their skin but the content of their character i think of men like him when i think of faithfulness i think of the brothers and sisters, the men of God, the women of God along the way who suffered on the mission field. I think of brothers and sisters, men and women of God who suffer and who don't say it, but who go through hell in the ministry, who fight day in and day out with their own insecurities, with, with the critiques and criticisms, with, with some of the, the most 
painful circumstances in their own lives and in their churches, and yet they stay faithful to follow Christ. I think of of men and women who struggle in their marriages and who say, I just want to leave. I just want to go. I'm done with this. I'm not happy here, but God but God gives them the power by his Holy Spirit and through the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ to be faithful. And listen, the devil will try to get you to compromise your Christianity. That's his job. That is his job. The devil will try to make you turn away. He'll try to make you turn towards complacency. Oftentimes, listen, this is, this is Satan's greatest strategy. And if you're not aware of it, you need to get aware today. Satan's greatest strategy against you is not to get you to give up your faith. He's just trying to get you to be ineffective in your faith. So if he can turn you inward, if he can shut you up, if he can put you in the house so that you are not going out, so that you are not proclaiming in the public square, so that you are just saying, oh, well, I've got my relationship with God. It's just me and God, and, and I'll stay here, and it's just me. Then Satan can keep you under lock and key because you've got the power. It's just never going to go anywhere. It's like if he has you flipping a switch and you turn on one light bulb and you're happy with that little light that shines above your head, but you don't care about activating the power grid that will light up an entire city that will give light to a dark nation. You know, Satan just doesn't want you to be effective. He, 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 he locked the Christians in prison. Why? Because they were being too effective. He, he, he tried to get the Christians under persecution. Why? Because he was doing whatever it would take to keep them down, to shut them in and shut them up. And listen, I understand how hard it is to be faithful to Christ. Please understand me. Please understand, there are some of you out there right now who are saying, I can't win this way. I can't do it this way, Pastor Brian. I'm tired. I'm tired. And Pastor Brian, you got to believe I tried. I tried. I tried in my marriage. But Pastor Brian, I'm done. I tried to be kind and love my enemy. But they drove me to a point where I had to give them a piece of my mind or I had to let my hands do the talking. Pastor Brian, I'm sick of what I'm seeing in our society. You know what? I'm about to lash out. I'm about to do something that is not Christ-like. I'm about to go and handle my business. But Jesus teaches us. Jesus teaches us. You got to hold out and hold on. You can say, I tried. But until... You suffered with Christ until you've known the fellowship of his suffering. You haven't tried. You haven't pressed in deep enough. And this is where today, this is where we are feeling the pain of really suffering with Christ. Because now it's not just affecting my church atmosphere. Now it's not just affecting my religiosity. Now it's affecting me in my home. Now it's affecting me on my job. Today, we can't be silent to things that are unjust. We can't be silent and compromise as Christians because now more than ever, we are forced to speak out. We are forced to rise up. We are forced to call righteousness what the Bible says is righteous, to call holiness what the Bible says is holy. And so I want to submit to you that your faith in Christ is tested. Your faith in Christ is truly tested. Hear me now. 
when you have to rise above adversity. Let me say that again. Your faith in Christ is truly tested when you are forced to rise above adversity. And this is what we read as we take a quick detour into Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 12. This is what we read. And I love when the word of God preaches itself. This is what gets me so excited. The word of God preaches to our souls, to our spirit. And it says this, Hebrews 12, 4 through 12. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? The writer of Hebrews now goes into scripture. He says, my son, do not make light of the Lord discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, Woo! not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No, discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Whew. That ain't no joke right there, y'all. I don't know how, how much more I can press this upon you. How much more the word of God can press this upon you. The writer of Hebrews says, this is a hard truth, but the Lord allows Satan to afflict us so that we become disciplined in our faith. The Lord allows us to undergo disciplines, allows us to go through trials, just like you allow a baby to stand up and fall down and, 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 and hold on to something and fall down and stand up and fall down all over again as he or she learns to walk. Just as you say to your kids, don't you touch that hot stove. But they touch that stove and it burns them. And you get them the ice. But you have to allow them ultimately to feel the heat. You tell them, don't you, don't, don't you do that. Don't you go there. I'm telling you, don't you mess with that. And they do it and you cannot hold them back. You can, I should say, but you don't because you love them enough to teach them and train them. This is what God does for us. Jesus says, yeah, you're going to suffer. You're going to go through it. You're going to deal with some pain and Satan's going to afflict you. But know that I'm with you. But know that this is only perfecting you in your faith. And ultimately, ultimately, the most difficult thing that Satan can inflict upon you is the thing that will draw you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. Jesus reminds us, whoever has ears, mm, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, would you let the Spirit of God speak to you today? The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. 
Jesus reminds us that we cannot, that we cannot allow Satan to rob us of our eternal destiny with the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil wants to take you out of the game. He wants you to die in your sin so that you do not enjoy eternity with Christ. But no, Jesus says, when you persevere, when you trust in me through it all, I've got something glorious for you on the other side. And please understand, hear me clearly through all of this, I am not an advocate of just waiting to heaven to get all the goodies. I'm not saying just deal with this life and and suck it up, buttercup, and wait till you get to heaven. No, I'm saying this, Jesus teaches that the kingdom of heaven is here and it's there. Look into the Gospels and see what Jesus teaches. He teaches that the kingdom is both now and not yet. That you can experience the joy, the peace, the contentment, the compassion, the love that is found in the kingdom of God here and now. And that will carry you on into a continuity into eternity. You will continue doing what you've done in this life, in the next life. Jesus encourages us, don't wait for heaven. Start living now as one who is enjoying Christ and your joy in Christ will be greater than any suffering you endure so that you can be faithful under this suffering season. Wow. So with that, I want us to close in prayer. And I want to say to you, if you don't know the peace of Jesus Christ, if you don't have the compassion, the love, the joy, if you're not content and you're feeling like you, you, you are, you are losing heart every time you turn around, Jesus invites you to have a joy that you've never known that will carry you through suffering, that will carry you through this life that is filled with trials, but is sweet in your eternal victory. If that's you, if you say, I need the Lord Jesus because I can't make it through the trials that Satan presents to me. None of us can. If you say, I need a peace that I've never known before. If that's you today, I just want to encourage you to pray even now. You can pray with me, Lord Jesus. I need you. I need you today. I need you tomorrow. I need you for the rest of my life, and I need you through all eternity. Lord Jesus, would you help me to endure? Would you guide me by your grace into a relationship where I get to know how you suffered well and how I can suffer faithfully? Would you help me, Lord? Lord Jesus, I know that you came to this world, you lived a sinless life, and you died a sinner's death. And when you died, you died to give me the right to be a child of God, to follow God, to be disciplined by God, and to be made more and more and more like you, Jesus. So would you help me today to receive you, to walk with you in your holy name? And for those Praise God for those who are are saying, Pastor B, I know Jesus, but man, I don't know that I know how to suffer that way. I don't know how to suffer faithfully. Listen, I'm learning. I'm learning as well. Walking with the Lord for this long, I'm learning. But let me tell you this. Jesus will give you the grace and he will empower you to endure. So as we wrap it all up, we close it out. I want to pray with those who need the endurance, who need the wherewithal to bear with Christ and to know him in the fellowship of his suffering like never before so that we can run this race 
and that we can see Jesus in eternity and see his face smiling and shining upon us, saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for calling us, for counting us as worthy of suffering with Christ, whether it be physical trauma, whether it be uh, mental anguish, whether it be emotional challenges, whether it be that we suffer for the sake of preaching the gospel. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to give us the power to follow the Lord Jesus like never be for to follow him to keep in step with him to to love him more than we love this life to know that his kingdom is upon us and that we can enjoy every blessing and benefit here and as we do as we press on through that we cross over that beautiful finish line we'll get to greet those who've endured as well who've suffered along with him and along with us and we will all know that it was worth it so father we thank you we all pray in jesus name and somebody better say amen and amen all right y'all that's gonna do it for this sermon may god bless you may god keep you we'll see you next time at common ground vineyard church online